right, coastal erosion. If you type coastal or beach erosion into Google, then in approximately 0.49 seconds, I think they tell me, they'll bring back 49,900,000 results. Flick through to the image search, and this is roughly what you'll get. And if you look around the world, and you, you dig into the references from this, you'll find that coastal erosion appears to be a unanimous global issue um, from, from Japan and Australia through to the UK. But coastal erosion is not new. It's something that's been going on for, you know, millennia. Most of the sand that's, well, not most, but some of the sand on our beaches is actually a product of coastal erosion. And the white cliffs of Dover only remain white because of continued erosion. So what's all the fuss? I mean, have people quite simply just put their houses in rather silly places and then complaining about it? If you think about sand, sand is constantly moving. It's, it's always on the move due to waves or currents, and it's generally speaking, um, you know, rarely ever sort of stationary. Now, to put, to give one good example, um, or two examples here actually, um, if you look at the Scilly Isles, they've been monitoring their beaches for you know, a num number of years. And if you look very carefully on this map, where you see the little red marks, this is where they've had erosion. And just adjacent or nearby, you'll often you'll see some blue marks where they've had you know, an increase in sand. So you can see fairly clearly from this, this map that actually you know, the sand has moved, you know, you've had gains or losses in different places. And they tell me that if you actually sum all of this up and you look around the islands as a whole, they find that the amount of sand is generally fairly static. It's not really changing a great deal. It just likes to go on holiday and it goes round and round these islands. And I'm going to get the name wrong here, but I think it's spelt, said Dua, Duag, um, which is on the west coast of Ireland, is, is a rather unfortunate event. So in about 35 years ago, the inhabitants of Dua in, woke up and discovered that their beach had just disappeared. They had a, had a beautiful sand beach like you see below. And that was after a storm. And about, well, in, in May of 2017, they woke up to discover, after another storm, to discover their beach had reappeared, as, as it had below, <laughs> which was fantastic. Tourism took off, you know, everyone was quite excited about their beach. And then sadly, in January of this year, it disappeared again. <laughs> and I think my point about that is that Storms can bring sand to beaches, and they can also take it away. Now, I'm sure many of you will have followed the fantastic TV series by David Attenborough, so, and seen the immeasurable changes that are taking place on our, in our ocean, or in our, in our world, sorry. And in particular, what I want to draw your attention to is, is over the last 30 years, there has been a marked increase in the frequency of storms. They've gone up by about 80%. And... It got so bad last year, in fact, that if you actually looked, if you remember, we had hurricanes quite literally queuing up to cross over the Atlantic. On top of that, you can't help but escape from you know, the news that we have got rising sea levels. I mean, quite simple physics. Glaciers that are on land, obviously, are melting. That water is running into the ocean. And our sea levels are going up by around about 3.3 millimeters per year. That's the average. And you think about 3.3 millimetres, well, that's sort of 10 centimetres over a 30-year period. I mean, it's kind of, you know, so what? But that pace is set to increase dramatically. So most of the computer models are predicting one to two and a half metres of sea level rise by the end of this century. And that's assuming a sort of three degrees of, of, of Celsius of warming. And if you then go and look around and see what the impact is on some of our major cities of the world... Um, Osaka in Japan, that, fl that increase in sea levels would displace, I think it was 5.4 million people. In um, Singapore, it's something like 17.5 million people. Miami would frankly be completely underwater. And what's even scarier, even if we don't get three degrees of warming, we only get two, the majority of the bottom third of Florida will actually go underwater by the end of the century. 
So we've got a series of quite significant problems. And I want to bring this home a little bit to, to the UK. So this is from 1953. So in January 1953, we had the combination of three quite unique events. I mean, this is a one in 200 year um, scenario at that time. And what happened is we started off with something that's very, very predictable, which is a spring high tide. It happens every year on the dot. We know when it's going to happen. No problem. But it was combined with, with a very strong wind, which was coming down the North Sea. And this kicked up a lot of waves. But it also, as it came down the North Sea, it quite literally pushed the water up onto the land. And on top of that, we had a low pressure system, which is marked by this red line, which was moving across the North, North Sea. And that quite literally sucked up the water. It lifted up the water. The net result was that along the coast of the eastern coast of the UK, particularly um, around Norfolk, sea levels rose by about one to two and a half meters above the predicted high water marks for that time. It's kind of similar to what we were just seen for, for the global global increase in, in sea, sea level right, or sea levels. But we got, we're now, you know, with the global sea levels, we're going to get that every day. This was just a once in a 200 year event. Now, the prediction is this type of event is now going to occur more or less every seven years by the middle of the century. And unless we really get our act together, by the end of the century, it could possibly be something that we see every couple of years. Now, fortunately, we have beefed up our, our defences. We've built the Thames Barrier, and the Dutch have done an awful lot of other, other work around that. But the reason I bring this event to your sort of attention is because the defences around, around our eastern coast, when those waves came down, those waves, they overtopped our defences, they, they you know, overspilled, they went round all of the man-made and also natural defences. I mean, it was kind of war. They figured out the water was going to get round and get through to the, through to the coastline, or sorry, through, through to, the, to the land. But crucially, about 1,200 of our defences, so these are embankments and sea walls, were destroyed or breached during that event, just over a very short period of time one night. And which brings me on to my, or well, back to my beaches. Right now, because of the, the, the warming that we've already seen, 70% of our coastlines are seeing increased erosion globally. And to dive a little bit into what's actually going on here, um, and to add a little bit to what I said earlier, the sand that you see on our beaches. A majority of it is, is, is sediment that's washed off the mountains. And that is deposited down via rivers, typically. And it's, it comes down onto the sea. And the finer or the larger bits of grit and sand tend to stay closer to the shore. And the silts get washed way out into the sea. Now, smaller waves, like you see on what I'm trying to illustrate on the top here, tend to move sand towards the shore. And larger waves tend to pull it back away. Um, away, okay? And the larger waves do that because as they crash down, they dump so much water onto the beach that they effectively, the backwash sort of tears away the, the sand below it and brings it back. But you might be thinking, well, hang on a second, Hawaii has big waves. They have fantastic beaches. No problem. What's the difference? Well, essentially, if you think about the, the profile of your, of your beach or your, your coastline, it's kind of tuned itself to the, 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 the general wave conditions of, those de of that day. So your, your, your profile here may, may be suitable to these waves because that's what it sees 300 days of the year. But if suddenly you introduce to it a wave that is completely out of character for that region, you're going to create something very, very different. You're going to create an awful lot of erosion until, you know, if this becomes the norm, then eventually you'll end up with a very different beach profile and everything will, you know, get back to some sense of normality. The problem is, depending on where you are in the world, the erosion that might take place might quite possibly be underneath your house or some other defences that you've already got, which is what we saw in 1953 and what a lot of people have seen with their houses over, over time. Now, fortunately, nature has solved this problem you know, as is often the case previously. And coral reefs are extraordinarily good at protecting coastlines. And they do this quite simply by 
the, the waves come, as the waves come in, you have a coral reef in this sort of zone, and it causes the waves to break, dissipating their energy at sea. So all of the, the crashing and all of the commotion occurs where there's some deeper water just behind it, leaving some very calm waters going, going towards the shore. All right? Fairly, fairly straightforward. Unfortunately, as we are so talented at, in, this, in this world, we have managed to destroy about 60% of our coral reefs, and the remaining two thirds are somewhat stressed. That doesn't mean to say that the, the, the foundation of that reef had gone, it's just that the, the, sort of the, the tree, the leaves of those, of those corals, the softer parts of those corals have been taken away. Now, make this a little bit more sort of personal, this is me kite surfing in the Grand Bahamas. And I was there about three months after Hurricane Matthew passed through on its way to Florida. And at this part of the beach, you can see this is quite a large wide beach. There's a lot of sand. All of the properties on this side, of, side were perfectly OK. No real damage. But if you went to the end of this oops, if you went to the end of this picture, you saw this. And almost every single property at the end of this, this that lower picture had their front gardens or front walls taken away, right? It's, it was quite striking at that, to see that. And the only difference between those two zones was at the bottom, there was a, a reef about 500 meters out to sea, and in the top, there wasn't. It had come to an end. And you see the same effect. If you look down, say, the, this is the east coast of Mexico. I'm just looking at Google Maps. Where you see there are reefs, you often see the land is sort of you know, protruding out, and the same up here, and where the reefs have either died or weren't, never ever grew, you see the lands being cut away. And you see this globally for where, wherever you go. So what's our solution to this? Well, I'm so sorry to say, I'm just trying to copy nature. We are trying to build artificial reefs. And we do this in a relatively straightforward way. We put steel mesh in the sea, and we pass into this an electrical current. It's a very low electrical current, and this initiates uh, electrolysis, or, or drives electrolysis. And the, the electrolysis is crucial because what we're doing is we're taking natural minerals in the sea, and they're cause, causing those to sort of solidify or calcify out around the steel, forming limestone rock, um, or, or otherwise calcium carbonate rock. And what we're aiming to do is we are going to place these steel meshes on, on the bottom of the ocean, and in places where corals have died, we possibly put these on top of the existing corals to help them bring them back to get life. And away we go. And the great thing about this is, first of all, we're not introducing any, apart from the steel, we're not introducing any new sort of minerals or any new materials into the ocean, particularly. And from what we've seen, corals, generally speaking, like the they like this. They actually benefit from the, the, that, that small electrical current as well, and they grow a little bit faster. And we're doing some work with the Bermuda Institute of Ocean Sciences to sort of validate, validate this. Now, this isn't a technique that we've invented. This, is, uh, this has been around for about 30 years, and it's been used traditionally for making sort of small sculptures under, uh, under the ocean. Um, my, Microsoft last year did a... Did a made a little area where they tried to make underwater, or well they did, they made some underwater Minecraft characters. So we had a turtle, a dog, and a few other bits and pieces, right? What we're bringing to the, the approach is to saying, well, actually, we want to scale this up from a small-scale thing to now starting to create large-scale reefs. And we're bringing together a combination of technologies. So first of all, we've, we've developed a, a wave device, and we can use either wave or solar power if it's close enough to shore. We put it into some fairly fancy electronics and software that distributes the power into our reef. And we then grow our rock, which is you know, creating samples just like this. Okay? And the crucial element here is that the, ele the, the electrical power you put into this reef, you have to get it right. If you put, it, you put in less than 1.23 volts, nothing happens. Put in too much, and you create a material that's very rich in magnesium and is actually it looks a bit more like cottage cheese. It's quite soft, and you could carve your name in it with a, with, a, with a knife. So you actually need to fluctuate your power you put into this to get it, get it right, and you actually to grow the sort of the harder rock that we need to actually create a sort of structure that can resist the, resist the bigger waves. Now, overall, we see this as a, a 
I mean, you know, a beautiful solution, but the, you know, I think to bring it to my sort of, what was the, what was the word? Bold prediction. Bold prediction, yeah. Overall, we see, the, you know, if you're going to combat coastal erosion, you have to start working and thinking like nature would. So my prediction is that we will actually be able to restore many of the coral reefs that we have in the world, right? And it's due to a combination of things, but largely, largely, you know, corals are essential not only for protecting coastlines and protecting, you know, vast swathes of our population, but they are also extraordinarily, um, you know, important to our ecosystem. I mean, a quarter of all the fish of what life in the world live in or were born in coral reefs. So without them, that I'm hoping humanity will come to its senses and realise that we have to start actually investing in these ecosystems to get, you know, to have fish, to have, you know, the, the world that we want to live in. But on top of that, if we can build certain parts of the reef and we can plant onto that with our friends who are, you know, marine biologists and plant, you know, healthy corals that are that that, that can thrive. That the, the spores from those will spread out into the surrounding areas, and there's a lot of evidence to suggest that they will reseed parts of the reefs that have previously died. So overall, we, I do think, with a little bit of effort from all, all those concerned, we can bring back our coral reefs, we can create beautiful dive tourism sites that, that helps to pay for this sort of technology, we can enhance our fisheries, and like my gentleman here, um, on, on the robotics, we can also start to collect data because although he didn't say it, we probably know more about the surface of Mars than we do about the, you know, the, the coasts and, uh, and our oceans. And with power at sea, we feel that we can actually start to bring you know, a lot more information and data to bear and hopefully understand a little bit more about what's going on out there. Thank you.